everybody. Welcome. My name is Sharon Bonney. I'm the CEO for the Coalition on Adult Basic Education, and I am so excited about our webinar today. But before we get started, um, there's a few things I wanted to share with you. One is, as you probably saw from the short video, National Apprenticeship Week is one component of the workforce work that COAB is doing. So this is one component of a Behind Every Employer campaign that COAB is leading. And I want to invite you that if you are working in the workforce space, as most WIOA programs are, then you are welcome to call in and participate on our podcast, our Behind Every Employer podcast. And we would love to have that from you as in the field. Next, I wanted to also encourage you to put your name and the organization you're joining us from in the chat box. And then finally, I want to introduce Rizal and Christine because these ladies uh, really knocked my socks off when I was in Maine and went to their session and learned about what they were doing in their pre-apprenticeship program. So I asked them to present here to, with all of you to share about what they're doing there in Maine. Rizal and Christine, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for joining us, making time for this. I wanna say Rizal is an award-winning administrator in Maine. I've known her for over a decade. She does just amazing work. And I just got to know Christine a bit through the session that I saw at the main conference. So ladies, I'll turn it over to you now. Hi, Sharon. Thank you so much. I'm Christine McAllister. I am a program manager with the Maine Apprenticeship Program uh, within the Maine Department of Labor. And I'll let Raizel introduce herself. Good afternoon, I'm Raizel Ward. I am the Assistant Director now at Lewiston Adult Education in Lewiston, Maine. Previously was a director at MS8052 in Turner, Maine, and have been working in some capacity in adult education for, I'm getting like 25 years now, I think, so, and I'll be um, laying out one of the programs that we have done a lot of work on for apprenticeship. Great. So with that, I'll go ahead and uh, share our presentation. So today we are going to talk about how creating uh, pre-apprenticeship programs um, in Maine is leading to credentials and meaningful employment within the adult education space. And so I know it's National Apprenticeship Week. I know some of you are involved in registered apprenticeship programs, but some of you may be newer to it. So I always like to lay a foundation so that everyone has a sort of a common definition of what we're talking about today. So when we're talking about registered apprenticeship, those are programs that are recognized um, either by state agencies such as Maine um, or by uh, national agencies um, through what's called the Office of Apprenticeship, which is through the US Department of Labor. Um, every registered apprenticeship though is, is recognized by US Department of Labor, either through the state or federally. Um, and they all have seven components. And the biggest piece of this is that they are industry and business led. So we have to have an employer uh, to have a registered apprenticeship. These are paid jobs. People are earning while they're learning. I'm sure you've heard that terminology. And it could apply to apprenticeship. It could apply to other types of training programs. With registered apprenticeship, though, this is a structured on the job training program. It has a mentor. Uh, so it has someone that is teaching that individual what they need to learn for a specific occupation. Um, and I'm sure many of you have had jobs uh, where you get on the job, you might have a few hours of training, maybe a day of training, and then it's, you know, good luck, have fun. Uh, and, you know, that's not always the best experience. And so with registered apprenticeship, it's at least 2000 hours of paid on the job training. Um, and it has supplemental education, also called related instruction or related technical instruction. Um, and some programs are four, five, or even six years. It really depends on the occupation. Within registered apprenticeship also, um, because there is training um, in this and you don't have to come in fully qualified, that helps to improve diversity within the programs and who is participating in these programs. There's also quality and safety baked into it. Safety training is a required component of registered apprenticeship. Um, and because people are getting trained for that job within that company, uh, that leads to better quality and better efficiency on the job. And then finally, when apprentices complete their program, uh, they get a nationally recognized credential. They get a certificate of completion stating that they have 
fully finish this program. So why? Why would you know someone want to um, start a registered apprenticeship program? You know, for employers. Well, it helps to, like I said, improve recruiting. So if you're only looking for fully fully qualified individuals, your recruitment pool is going to be fairly limited, especially in the current job market. Um, whereas if you are willing to train for the technical skills, you're going to open up um, your recruitment pool to a wider audience. Um, so that also leads to a more diverse workforce. Um, because you are then uh, training um, on outline skills um, on a, a work process schedule, uh, then you have higher productivity um, from your workforce and there are fewer accidents. So that's a win-win for everyone. With, with registered apprenticeship as well, especially within Maine, uh, we help connect employers to additional training funds to help offset some of the costs of this training. And we can customize that to meet employer needs. So within Maine, we have we have a number of different occupations, um, and so we can customize it for any employer, um, even an employer of one or two people uh, and one apprentice um, in Maine. And basically what we try to do is take any kind of training an employer does and then formalize it um, and enhance it uh, when we need to. And uh, the biggest part of apprenticeship, I would say, is retention. So sometimes employers will say, you know, what if I train this person and they leave? Well, over 90% of apprentices that finish their program are still with that employer a year later. Uh, so it really helps to improve retention of people. So it leads to, you know, lower recruitment and hiring costs. Um, and then they in turn get to train the next workforce. So in terms of apprentices and for those that are working, um, with people that are looking to get trained and look for careers and jobs, they get increased skills, right? They're, and they're getting that paycheck while they're learning. It also tends to lead to higher wages. So over the course of their lifetime, apprentices uh, earn over $300,000 more than those that don't participate in registered apprenticeship programs. They also have that mentor support. So you, they have someone to go to, to ask for questions, ask for advice, make sure they're doing things right. Um, within apprenticeship also, there are scheduled wage increases. So you know that you're gonna, you know, if you do X, Y, and Z, you're gonna get that next raise. Um, like I said, safer workplace, and you get that nationally recognized credential at the end of the apprenticeship. And, and oftentimes you're gonna get um, credentials in between um, leading up to that final certificate of completion. Registered apprenticeship can basically be for any type of industry. If you've heard of apprenticeship before, you may often think of construction and trades, and we certainly have a lot of apprenticeship programs in that. Um, but in Maine especially, we're really big into healthcare apprenticeships, manufacturing. Uh, we've done a lot of work recently in the education space. There's a lack of teachers across the country, and registered apprenticeship can help to fulfill that gap. Uh, we also in Maine had the first registered apprenticeship program in aquaculture. So uh, shellfish and seaweed aquaculture technician. So we have some really unique programs here in Maine, um, as well as your traditional electrician, plumber, and those types of programs. So we have these registered apprenticeship programs. They've been around for a really long time. Um, whether or not people know about it is another is another story. But not everyone is ready to enter into a registered apprenticeship program. Uh, not everyone knows exactly what they want to do and if they want to commit to you know, maybe potentially a four-year training program. So in Maine, we created what are called certified pre-apprenticeship programs. And those were uh, formalized in our state statute in 2023. So we've only had certified pre-apprenticeship programs in Maine for about a year and a half. And these programs are different because they are preparing someone to enter into a registered apprenticeship program. So they're intentionally short-term in duration. They're up to six months in length, um, unless they're in a high school setting um, or in a correctional facility. And then they can be up to two years in length uh, in those settings. Um, but some of the programs um, might be four weeks um, or even less than that. It just depends on the program and the audience that they're looking uh, to serve and the training um, gaps that they're looking to fill. Pre-apprenticeship is also hands-on training. 
um, and we want it to be in a workplace, in a simulated lab, or a work-based learning environment. Um, so it could be, you know, that they're working, um, you know, in a in a lab setting on, you know, an electrical box, um, or you'll hear from Raizel and how they do their healthcare training um, and the different components and tools they use to kind of simulate um, what that experience is going to look like in the workplace. As with registered apprenticeship, safety training is also a required component of certified pre-apprenticeship, and it's going to depend on the industry, what that is. It could be OSHA 10. Um, it could be serve safe in the hospitality industry. Uh, so we just make sure it makes sense for that industry, uh, what that safety training includes. The other unique piece with pre-apprenticeship here in Maine is that we do require an outreach plan for underrepresented um, and underserved uh, individuals. So, you know, with registered apprenticeship, those have served, you know, the traditional population that you might think of when you think of registered apprentices, um, but women, uh, the BIPOC community, people with disabilities, they've all been traditionally underserved in registered apprenticeship. So pre-apprenticeship is a way to further increase that recruitment pool and bring more people into this registered apprenticeship space. And so we work with the organizations that are uh, certifying these pre-apprenticeship programs to develop what that plan looks like and who they're going to do outreach to, uh, to try to you know, further diversify the workforce here in Maine, and then also make sure everyone has these opportunities available to them. So in Maine, um, this is the nuts and bolts is that it's a formal partnership with at least one or more registered apprenticeship programs. So you can't have pre-apprenticeship without that registered apprenticeship on the other side. Um, it could be more than one registered apprenticeship. They could have multiple pathways to go into, but we need at least one um, opportunity for those individuals to go into. And then we want it to include some combination of a job shadow, mentored and paid work experience, a guaranteed interview, it may or may not be a guaranteed spot, but at least a guaranteed interview. Um, or advanced placement. So maybe they get credit for some of the training that they've already done and they don't have to repeat that as an apprentice. Um, so they might get advanced standing in that program. There's some other uh, ways that you can also connect, but these are kind of the four main ways that we have uh, to connect to those registered apprenticeship programs. And just with registered apprenticeship, pre-apprenticeship can be in any industry. These are the current industries that we have that have certified pre-apprenticeship programs. So you'll see the familiar construction and trades and automotive, um, but you also see education, healthcare, manufacturing, food and hospitality, and aquaculture. Uh, so we have all of these different pathways that people can go into. In terms of who these participants are for pre-apprenticeship, basically our only requirement is there they're at least 16 years or older. Uh, work authorization may or may not be required. So for apprenticeship, that is a requirement because they are working. With pre-apprenticeship, they may just be doing that training. They may not be working and they may not be a paid employee. So it might be a requirement of that program. It might not. It depends on how it's structured. Um, and one of the really interesting things we found with pre-apprenticeship is that for those that are waiting work authorization, um, it can take up to six months for them to obt obtain that authorization. So in that time, you know, what are they doing? And so pre-apprenticeship can be a really great way to fill that time so that they are training for an occupation. Um, they're getting any credentials they need ahead of time, getting the skills that they need, potentially in English language skills, and so once they get that work authorization, they are ready to go. Um, and so that's kind of um, a really great model, especially for our adult education centers here in Maine uh, that seems to be working out pretty well. Um, and then some other requirements can vary depending on the program. So, you know, for the Maine apprenticeship program, um, like I said, our only requirement is they're at least 16 years or older. And then the specific program can set additional requirements uh, for entry into their pre-apprenticeship. So that's sort of an overview of the pre-apprenticeship landscape. 
Um, it's a really great way to create that pipeline uh, for employers that have registered apprenticeship programs. Um, and it's a good way for pre-apprentices to also find out, is this really what they want to do? Um, so they can kind of test the waters before they really commit to a full registered apprenticeship program. Um, so this is uh, my contact information, and I'll be happy to drop it in the chat um, if you have any specific questions about our program here in Maine. And with that um, overview of what registered apprenticeship and certified pre-apprenticeship are in Maine, I will turn it over to Raizel to talk about um, the specific uh, pathway that she has helped to develop. Thank you, Christine. Um, I'm going to just, before we start moving the slideshow along, and are you doing that, Christine, or do I? You have to do it. Yep, I can do it. Perfect. Okay. I wanted to give you some background on um, our healthcare apprenticeship pathway, and, it, and we call it that because it is a pathway to an apprenticeship. Um, some background and data that we used when we were deciding how to write a grant that was through the Department of Labor and what kinds of data we used, just a real short umbrella, but um, some of that background in the U.S., one in 10 work age adults are English language learners, multi-language learners in Maine with one of the highest median ages and one of the lowest birth rates in the United States. The ELL population right now stands at about, um, there's about, they're 15% more likely, the ELL population, than US born, Maine born people to be of working age. So they're right in that spot where they want work, they need work and um, we have, most of us on the other end of the spectrum. In Lewiston, which is our local program, and just so you know, in Maine, um, adult education programs run under school districts. They don't run under community colleges or other places like that. They run under school districts. So our program in Lewiston, last year, as an example, had over 1,800 students come in our doors, not for the pre-apprenticeship pieces, but 1,800 from all the things that we offer from basic adult basic education, um, the lowest levels of ELL, all the way up through college preparation and bridge programs, enrichment programs, and our workforce training programs. We had over 1,800 students last year, and currently, and we're not halfway through the year, we have over 1,200 right now. In our program in Lewiston, we have a representation of 57 countries with 43 different languages. And over 85% of our students are multilingual learners. We can go on to slide two, please. This is just a picture of some of our students that have gone through the pathway or are going up through the pathway as they're learning. So Lewiston Adult Education has created a number of pre-apprenticeship training and pipelines that are all employer connected. Those include a teller training program, applied workplace technology, educator academy, which is a an apprenticeship pipeline, and now a trade academy, which will be another apprenticeship pipeline. And we also offer and have running some employer design on-site instruction for multilingual learners. Again, today we're going to outline our healthcare pathway. You can switch. Thank you. This is just a real quick kind of overview of what that requirement looks like. And again, this pathway is a pre-apprentice connected to apprenticeship opportunity, which is a big piece of what we built to make sure that people didn't just have a credential, but they had a offer of, you know, or at least open the doors to employment in the area. Everything that we do is scaffolding with skills and language all the way through. So our first level is the foundations of healthcare. So all students come in there, um, the ones that we accept into the program, 
they all do what we call level one. They do a, they earn a bloodborne pathogen certification. They have basic healthcare, English language, and that foundations of healthcare people could enter. And then again, there if you see that um, picture to the right, multiple exits. They could leave the program after that because they have some sort of a certification that will help them get a job in places like food service or housekeeping in our healthcare facilities. To go on to the second level, PSS, they have had to been successful in foundation. So they um, go on to the PSS, which is, I should say, in case you don't know, personal support specialists. These are people that can work in long-term care facilities, do home visits under um, agencies that send people out to do care. And people in this area, and healthcare is huge everywhere, but in this area, you could get a full-time job doing PSS and probably a full-time plus job if you wanted to. To go from PSS into CNA, you've had to be successful in PSS, and you have to be able to demonstrate a number of things, of items like language acquisition, how much better can you speak and talk and interact? And some of that's a big safety concern. Some of that's um, employer concerns about making sure that people can be understood, understand, get directions. And then you go on to um, the CNA. Again, you've demonstrated language acquisition. You, your CASIS scores, which is our measure to get in the door to begin with, have demonstrated success, and you have to, in CNA, pass the state CNA exam. Um, to do this, and where to do this, the exam is an interesting one because it's the old school Scantron fill in the bubbles. So our first go round, we learned a lot as we built this, was they did not even know the little number two pencil fill in the bubbles piece, so we had to teach that too. So now we start at the beginning with little fill in the bubbles, just small short quizzes and things to get them ready. Everything we do is moving them to getting ready. We also just um, received a new contract that we're going to have another branch added soon, which is foundations to PSS and then branching off into phlebotomy. So that's a really cool thing. The next one. So what we did when we said what are the goals, we wanted to start with the end in mind, which was what's written here, communication, communicating in English with clients and patients and staff and emergencies, and then demonstrating a high level of patient care with skills, possessing reading and test taking skills so we can have them complete state exams and do them successfully. Our second goal in that was also how to support local, local labor needs with local populations that are seeking employment. We have a huge influx of multilingual learners over the last um, 15 to 20 years, and we embrace them. And what's nice with this is this is a one great um, indicator of the people that they're working with now are sometimes people who speak their native language or their second or third language or fourth language. So it's kind of um, nice to hear back from our employers. We've been doing this for a couple of years now, that it was great to have this person. Who, and today I met a man who speaks Finnish, which I've never met before. And think about that there's probably someday an encounter with someone who speaks that, which would be much more comfortable for them in a healthcare setting or any setting. So it's really nice to be able to hear back from our um, employers how this works, how this communication is working. And that doesn't mean we don't have blips, and we'll tell you a few stories about that. But um, this is always uh, what we started with, was that curriculum piece. And if you can go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about what we did for some work with that. And that was taking our state curriculum, 
that was for PSS because we're required to use a certain color curriculum, take that PSS curriculum and put it into 10 core topics and then taking the CNA and doing the same thing so that we could put in those topics and then units to teach the, the same type of information that just got more rigorous as you went up the pipeline or the levels. So obviously we were doing a lot more English language, increasing fluency, getting a lot more um, speaking and reading and writing and scaffolding things just to make sure that, it, and I will call this, it's probably on a slide here, but I call it Pete and repeat all the way up through. And then the clinical skills, which they learn right even from the beginning, some of the clinical skills become deeper and more intense as they go. If you go to the next slide, Christine, this is just one very brief um, example of it. All the paths repeat and build on the skills from the previous pathway. So in level one, you learned hand washing and you learned it over and over and over again and the reason behind it. Level one and two, then you started some gloving, and then in two, you did some more intense things, and then in three, two and three, you were doing donning and doffing. So we didn't just have people demonstrate things once or twice. They're doing this over and over and over. And again, the language bridge and the skill bridge kept moving up and getting more rigorous. Next one. And then we have the language acquisition piece, and this was a huge deal um, to get this built and how did we build it? And I would say this is probably about exactly what we're doing now, but we worked on study skills. We worked on digital literacy and that's just because everything's with computers now. We um, use NGEN, if you haven't seen that, we've used NGEN as our, um, using that as kind of what you call the homework and practice using that to as digital literacy and as part of the work skills, using Google Workspace to be able to share information. We use ONET as part of exploring some other healthcare careers that people might want to go into. And WhatsApp is part of our um, connection with that particular class. We also have Work Ready, which is a state certification. You'll see that, I think, in the next slide or the slide after. And I'll speak more about that then. And then we have writing and speaking in the workplace. So we do pieces with case studies and somebody asks what happened or you walked by a door and you saw something. How do you write that and how do you do objective versus subjective incident reports? Very short, very sweet, but it gets them a start on their language piece. And that's also part of those observation exercises. And if I'm going to go, oh, yep, work great. Oh. Now, how did that happen? <laughs> We're jumping around. It's fine. Um, let's just go to that one. So Work Ready is a state certification that was built by the Department of Education and the Department of Labor many years ago. And it's always getting refined. But the real um, base of it is that's demonstrating seven, there's seven competencies. These on the list here. And includes job search and interview skills. So one of the things that we've done is said, you're going to have to go through and have these conversations and some demonstration, some examples of personal motivations and challenges to employment. And what do you do when there's barriers to getting here and on time? And what do you do and setting those goals? And the interesting part is, is what we expect in the United States for work is not, the expectations all over the world are very, very different. So on time is a little more fluid in some countries than it is here. And leaving because I have to is not something that is great, greatly accepted in most of the United States workplace. But how do you, um, the rest of this, how do you develop a plan for employment, which we're working with them on all the way through? How to communicate, effective work together. We make them work together in different teams and stuff. And just, you know, you may not like this person for some reason, but you have to work with them. So we're watching. And we tell people we're watching all the time. Um, the work-related safety stuff is really big. And, our, and then at the end, we have, um, as part of employer engagement, have some great um, 
interviewing pieces and events that are um, highly, highly effective. That's what I'll say. Do you want to move to the next one? I want to talk about how do we pick students, and I will say um, the other day I did this and was asked, you know, how did it start out and how did you advertise? And the first time around, if if we had 10 or 15 people that wanted to be in this, I would have been surprised. We had a very small class, which hindsight would be, that would that's okay because we got to practice what we thought we knew. And, um, but now, because we have, and you'll probably see this on another slide, but we have over 100 people that are have already been, vetted to a degree to say they could be eligible for this program. We have a hundred, over a hundred right now waiting to go into January's class. So it's become, how did we advertise? We really don't need to anymore. We have, again, the students to come into school, but we also are really connected to a number of um, support agencies around, but our best, um, I said our best advertising is word of mouth from our students. And from some of our academic teachers that are here, because they are said, you can do this, get ready, you know, do your conversation, do your writing, do your reading, and get ready so you can go into that next class. And so they're really doing a lot of cheerleading, which is helpful. Again, compelling interviews. And one of the things I will say is that um, we have a, a large number of people who present to come into our program that have been doctors and nurses and dentists and lots of high level jobs in their country. And for whatever reason, their um, what they are certified in is not accepted here in Maine or the United States, or they can't get their recommendations, they can't get those things. And so many of them are here, okay, I'll start at the beginning again. But um, what we hope for them is that they sit and have the conversations with our prospective employers to say, how do I get back to where I want to be? How do I become a nurse again? Because that's where I'm headed. And this is to help them get there. Um, I think, oh, let me see, recommendations from current instructors, prior experience, casting re CASIS reading scores of 220, which is one of our um, benchmarks. And I say sort of, because that's not always true. We need to get people's um, fluency in reading and test taking way up in the amount of time we have to do this. But the 220 might become a 218 or a 17 if someone has a, a really good grasp of spoken English, which is helpful. But if they don't have a great reading score nor a great speaking um, then we're going to have to probably put them to the maybe one, the maybe list. And that's only because we're trying to get the people who we can work with right away instead of having them go back into the, the, the ELL classes that we also have, go back there and keep working on it. Um, so those, I, we always say sort of for the 20, 220 cast. Next one. So this is what the schedule looks like for students who come in. They have to commit to three days a week, and it's six hours a day. And right now, we're doing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and they do this for level one, two, and three. And then at the end of level three, we also have the clinical piece for the CNAs, and those become um, – then there's some additional hours because we have to, in Maine, you have to do at least 40 hours worth of hands-on clinical in a setting, care setting to be able to let me pass CNA plus the state exam. So they have to, what Christine outlined was that sometimes we have a lot of students here who aren't work authorized yet. So again, what else are they going to be doing? So if this is what they wanted, it's a great way for them to get through, do language, get certification, get connected with area employers, and here comes my work authorization, and I can step into a job. We've had a graduation a few months ago here, 
and we had 16 students graduate and eight or nine of them before, by the time that graduation happened, had jobs or job offers. And then we've had the rest, almost the rest of them, I think there's like two more hanging out there. One of them had a baby two days later. So there was certainly a good reason why they weren't going to work right away. We do a main job link account that I don't know how many people have that in other states, but main job link is connected to Bureau of Employment Services and the career centers and the um, training funding providers. They, we also do a needs-based assessment. So, and that's for more of supports because we do get some funding to help support students who might need transportation assistance. We buy bus passes for some people. Some people need food. Some people need a tire for their car. So we do this stuff and ask them. And then we ask them as the program's going on, how are things going? Do you have any more needs? And continue with that. We also bring some funding with our training providers and some other area agencies. And we do ask that they've been applied for work authorization or they're doing it right away. And that's because most of our students are either asylum seekers, which means they have to wait a certain amount of days. They'll get theirs back faster after they wait. But we do have some that are you have to wait six months, and it's going to be six more months after that before you get work authorization. So we want ones that have at least applied because this program is a five and a half to six month commitment, but we don't want have have people that are then finishing it up, getting certified, and then have to wait four or five months to be able to go out and get their job. We do an interview with everybody. We do the CASAS. We have an intake. We have a healthcare pre-assessment, which is much just very simple, just basic. You know, a little bit of anatomy, a little bit of, um, uh, what do we call it, um, PPE questions, things like that. Just a little bit because what we want to know is do you, do you recognize any of this? And we do it at the end again just to see what happens and how much they've learned and have retained, which should be everything because they've been taking a lot of quizzes and tests just for practice. Even though we use them, it's a great practice tool. You can go to the next one. I didn't go and do the first couple of cohorts because they were very small, like six people and two people um, made their way all the way through it. Um, that, but we, if you can see, we started building. We had 17 registered for our cohort three, 17 that went through bloodborne pathogens of PSS, 15 took the state exam, 14 passed the test. So, I mean, that's a pretty good batting average for you know, six months worth of work, but you'll see these pictures that have people who have completed past to get certified. Cohort 24, cohort four had 28 students, 16 graduated, 75% already had job offers in, when they um, finished. Cohort five says they just stepped into PSS. We have 26 students. Actually, now that's been a little while. They are almost at the end, and they have two weeks left before they step into CNA. Our wait list for students is over 100. I've said that, but um, I think that's a pretty amazing number. And you can go to the next one. <laughs> so the big thing that work makes this work, even before, during, and after it, is the partnerships we have um, with our employers that are in the area. And this is, again, focused on health care, but we do the same thing with our other um, connections and our other pipeline training. We have great relationships with our employers, and it, it's not hard to build. We're pretty friendly, even though we're Maine and people think we aren't. <laughs> um, but we have somebody who's actually dedicated to building um, those connections and partnerships. She is part-time job here, and it's all about building those um, business connection and relationships. She does a great job at it, too. Um, we get support through the, our businesses with um, grant forms and building that rapport. And what is nice, and I'm getting, gonna go back down into healthcare, is our employers in that area agree to do tours. So we actually have, ne not the next week, the week after, we have 
four places that they're all just going to go tour and look at for no other reason than just to imagine yourself working here. And it's interesting because sometimes people think, our students think, this is, I know where I want to work. And when they come out after these tours, they're like, yeah, that doesn't feel like me. I think I want to go check more out about this connection. We do a um, wonderful thing called meet and greet. Between the time that they take their exam and they're waiting for the test results, because, again, it's got to go through Scantron, they're waiting for the test results that is a couple weeks out. We have our um, connected apprenticeship employers come in. We spread them out through this building, and the students go and meet them. But they're meeting. It's more that the students are interviewing the, the facility. They want to know, if I was a nurse, I want to be a nurse again. If I went here, what would you be able to do for me? And what is, you know, what kinds of benefits work to get more education? Or what if I need to um, go back to my country for three weeks at a time? Are you able to do that for me? They, it's a really interesting way to flip the narrative of it's got to be about that student also. It also gives our employers, and they do come up afterwards, and they say, like, I was really intrigued by this person and this person. I really want to see them more. We gave them a business card. We're really hoping that they're going to apply at our place. Um, we do our clinicals in our local healthcare care um, facilities. They help do some interviews, and they do some evaluations for us. We are always checking with them. If our business person is Tell me how it's going. Not just the clinical piece, but when they do get hired, what can we do for you? Um, what can we help? And what else do we need to teach? And I'm going to stop for a second on the um, slides just to say, this is a great example of what we need to teach. A cycle or two ago, we had a student who got hired at one of the healthcare facilities who talked about, um, was told or asked by a employee there to please go find a certain kind of bandage. And so that student wandered away, and uh, we heard later that it was 10 or 15 minutes, and um, they came back. No, I take that back. They went, they were asked to go get ginger ale, and they came back with some unusual bandage. And we were like, wow, well, we've never heard that. And so we sat back and kind of looked at our curriculum and we went, you know, we talk about clear liquids and we talk about soft food, but we don't teach them. So now there's a unit that is entirely a day of this is what they look like, they smell like, they taste like, this is what ginger ale is, here's what a clear broth is. And it was amazing because, of course, why would we think that ginger ale was so hard to know? what it is or where you would find it. So it was a wonderful um, learning opportunity for us. They taste broth, jello, juice. Um, and if you want to, we can go to the next one. And then here are our employee partners right now and our training partners, which is some of that, of course, on the DOL. And we would be nowhere without them. And they are, I will say that as one signed on and started having some great success, they kept, now they're all like, wait a minute, if they're doing it, we're doing it, and we're doing it. And it's become a really wonderful relationship, and we're really thrilled with it. And we like to be able to take that kind of essence and build it into some other healthcare pathways that we know, you know, that we can build, not, not healthcare, sorry, some other training pathways. One of the couple of the good data points that I want to end with is just so that you know, eight in the cohorts that we've run so far, 84 of our 84 percent of our grads, CNA grads, have found employment. And again, that's so far, some of them just had babies. Um, 68 percent of these that have completed all the way through CNA have begun or in or have completed an apprenticeship so far. 16% of all students 
plan on seeking employment later. And 100%, and this is not because we were standing there. This is a, a, actually a survey they took um, online. 100% reported that their English improved, they improved their confidence, they improved their digital literacy, and they improved their job skills. So um, we're very honored to be able to do this and to support it and to bring it to our community. And we love to be able to show what we're doing and to help others build something like this. I'm done. <laughs> Thanks, and, and Teresa. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Uh, I know that the um, there's been some chat that's come in. I don't know if Razel or Lindsay, you've been watching that. Um, so happy to take any questions anyone has. Oh, I wish I'd heard that earlier that it was difficult to hear. Is that better? <laughs> what does PSS stand for? In Maine, it's called a personal support specialist. It's kind of a CNA is here, RN is here, PSS is about here. There's a lot of things that a PSS can do. Um, and then there's more that a CNA is allowed to do legally. What I, I just want to add to what Razel ended on, um, what I love about this program that Razel has put together is in terms of apprenticeship, you know, they started with just one employer. That's all we need to start a registered apprenticeship. Um, but as she mentioned, other employers learn about it and so many others have signed on. And so, um, Basically, it's just expanded into all these different opportunities now that the Lewiston Adult Education pre-apprentices could go into. Now they have their choice of employers, and the the curriculum's really been built intentionally to, uh, you know, encourage employment and you know registered apprenticeship if it makes sense for those individuals. So, you know, I really love how intentional that uh, the program design has been and that. They're constantly tweaking it uh, based on feedback they're getting from participants and from employers. I would like to add a piece to that, that um, when I call, when I talk about our employer partners, every single one of them is now has a registered apprentice. And it's because they take our students and they are now for the next year an apprentice with them which again, you outlined before, what does that mean for an employer? So they're taking them and, and again, they were not, they were a little hesitant at the beginning of when we talked about, would you please do this? But they're all fully on board now and they really love the mentorship piece that's included with it. I see Aaron asked a question about the registered apprenticeships that this is attached to. So uh, Lewiston Adult Education is what's called an intermediary sponsor. So what that means is that they work directly with employers to put together a program um, and they're sort of the go-between between between the employers and the Department of Labor. And what they've developed is a CNA apprenticeship, so a certified nursing apprenticeship. Um, and what we have uh, here in Maine, it's usually, a, it's a one-year program, 2,000 hours, um, and most of the uh, related instruction is all up front through through this program. But that's, it's a CNA uh, program that they can go into, or they can choose, you know, there's multiple exit points, as Razel mentioned, throughout that pre-apprenticeship that they, you know, can choose to go off into a different um, tangent, if you will. Um, but we also hope that this is sort of a stepping stone. You know, some may stay at a CNA and some may choose to go on to doctor and be a doctor here in the U.S. So this is sort of, you know, it's an entry level job, but it is a registered apprenticeship. And so um, there's multiple other uh, opportunities for them to continue on. Any other questions? Somebody's asking if they can receive the slide deck. And yeah, we can share it with CoAbe if they want to send that out. 
we are fine with that. I would t like to say um, we have one on that series of slides. There's somebody, there's a gentleman who completed his apprenticeship already. He works at the in an ICU at a local hospital, and they met him when he was doing clinicals and said, we want him. And it was a hospital which had never done this um, apprenticeship piece before. And he's been working there for over a year now. And he works in the ICU. He works on other floors when they, they're always asking for him. He also, because it's, he was a doctor in Angola, he also ha is started um, the community college to take, he wants to take all the um, basic science courses in English. And so he started at the local community college a couple months ago. And about a month ago, we hired him to be a teaching assistant to do help with the skills piece of our, our pre-apprenticeship program, because it's getting so big, we can't, one teacher couldn't get the whole class to be able to do things without some help. So we actually brought him back. And we have another one we're keeping our eye on, who just started apprenticeship at another, at this, actually the same local um, umbrella hospital. And we're looking at him to think about maybe we're going to have him come back and do some help with the skills piece of the CNA program when they get through that next time. It's very cool. And it's lovely that they come in and they talk about the real life of doing this and what you have to, you, that you have to focus and you have to study and you have to be doing your homework and it it's great when they come in and stop and say it's worth it it's worth it <laughs> okay if you're reading the conversation thanks greg <laughs> new readers press Greg Stoltz, on the side of your chat, who says the first time in his life he's ever heard anybody say they couldn't hear me. <laughs> I'll call you later. All right. So, uh, Lindsay, I'm not seeing any more questions. So, um, we'll still be around if anyone has any questions. But thank you so much for taking the time today during National Apprenticeship Week to hear about, you know, what we're doing here in Maine with pre-apprenticeship and then uh, specifically with Lewiston Adult Education's Healthcare Pathways Pre-Apprenticeship. All right. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And thank you, Rizal and Christine, uh, for presenting today. Have a great day. Thank you.